Hello, welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel here on YouTube, the wine educational channel that helps you with all of your wine needs, specifically things like the WSET courses. I'm your host, Jimmy Smith, and welcome to our section here called Explaining Wine Terminology. So on this, we take a certain term, maybe through winemaking or grape growing or grape variety or something like that, and we give you the full lowdown on it. And here we have methoxypyrazine, very important concept to understand, which is an aroma compound that we find in grapes and in wine. As always, if you have any questions for me, you can get in contact with me via the comments section here on this YouTube video below. Please make sure you click subscribe as well. Make sure you're always kept up to date with our uh, recent updates here at Wine With Jimmy or by the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. Uh, or please go visit our e-learning portal at www.winewithjimmy.com, which has all of your wine educational needs. So methoxypyrazine, I think this is an important concept. If you are studying your diploma, WSET level four, absolutely pivotal. If you are studying your level three, which is below that, maybe this is a little bit out of your pay grade, but I teach my students at level three about it because I think it's important to understand the concept of methoxypyrazine and how that translates into characteristics in some typical grapes like Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc, for instance. So let's talk a little bit then through what methoxypyrazine, methoxypyrazine is exactly. Uh, so we've got a picture there of green peppers, abundant amount of green peppers, because one of the characteristics you may find within a wine with high percentage of methoxypyrazine is green pepper or things often associated like asparagus or grass and those kind of notes. But this is a very typical compound. OK, so we call this an aroma compound. OK, so in grapes, we have what are called aroma compounds and precursors. So an aroma compound is what we find in the grape and can be tasted in the grape. And when it's fermented, also potentially in the wine as well. An aroma precursor is one that is found in the grape, but not detectable until fermentation brings it out of its shell. So we are talking about the former here, an aroma compound and uh, two very famous aroma compounds, of course, methoxypyrazines, but also rotondin as well, which gives the very famous kind of crushed black pepper note to many uh, types of red wines around the world, classically. Syrah. So it is an aroma compound. Now, methoxypyrazines will develop prior to the raison, as you can see upon the slide. Now, hard green grapes start to grow in size after their fruit set, and that's the picture that you have on the left hand side. And it starts to, of course, increase in its levels of tartaric, malic acid, but also tannins start to accumulate. Um, sugar levels will remain quite low throughout this stage from fruit set up to colour change, the raison. So the other thing we need to mention though is at this stage we have methoxypyrazines. In certain varieties they are higher than others uh, but really uh, across the board we'll find methoxypyrazine as a compound in grapes as they are under ripe. So up to the raison, they are, there are a lot of these methoxypyrazines. Then during the ripening stage afterwards, and this is going up towards harvest, so picking, the methoxypyrazine rate will decrease. So with good ripe berries um, or even overripe berries, these compounds are minimal and will not impact the final wine style. However, in certain varieties and with certain instances, like picking early, for example, or Sauvignon Blanc, you will find that you can have these compounds in a higher amount. And that can, of course, impact the style of wine. 
Okay, so what creates the, the, the flavors of methoxypyrazine, which we will talk through later? Um, methoxypyrazine then. Now we have a few up here on this slide. So you see on the left hand side in the orange outline, I've identified the key compounds. It's really the top two, which is the most important, but I have included the bottom one as well for good measure. You'll see that the first one, isobutyl methoxypyrazine, or sometimes just written as IBMP, and let me just scribble that down. I'm gonna use a nice orange pen here for you as well. So IBMP. Uh, so that is a major, major um, compound. It's considered the most important and is typically present in wines at concentrations of around five to 30 uh, nanograms per liter, as you'll see here on this slide. Uh, and that is said to give that kind of um, a green pepper herbaceous and tomato leaf compounds into the wine. Next up is IPMP, which is isopropyl methoxypyrazine. So there you are, IPMP. Uh, so this is typically found in lower limits. Uh, they're, they're present at those lower levels um, and they really have a limiting effect on the uh, the uh, analytical sensitivity of, of, the, of the taster or the assessor, um, but they still do contribute. And of course you'll see a green bean and pea and grassy characteristics, but green pepper as well. And then there's finally secbutyl uh, methoxypyrazine, which is a little bit less so, but it's the top two which are mainly found in um, as aroma precursors. So they're all considered to be quite potent, especially the top, uh, and have sensory thresholds in, in water of around one to two nanograms per liter. Uh, so these, of course, are fairly uh, sensitive for most wine tasters. So they're the compounds we find. Now, why, why have them? Why do vines have these methoxypyrazines? Because if you think about it, these compounds like green pea, green pepper, grass, asparagus can be linked to it as well, they're quite potent, they're quite intensive. In fact, they can actually be overpowering in a wine. So why do these um, vines have these methoxypyrazine characters? So they typically will occur in unripe grapes. They'll have the, un, uh, the highest amount of methoxypyrazines because they haven't fully ripened. And maybe that's because the plant is acting as an antifedant. It's producing this as an antifedant along with high tannin levels, because at this same time, before the raisin, so before the start of ripening, you are increasing the tannins and they have not polymerized at that point. That comes after, during the ripening stage. So at this point, during summer, as those green grapes are getting a little bit larger, you have a very bitter astringent tannin. Uh, which is not polymerized, so that's quite off-putting. And then you have this green herbaceous methoxypyrazine. So it is thought that both of these compounds in, in combination are really an antifedant. Uh, that's basically the idea that the grapevine doesn't want its berries eaten by birds until the seeds are ready to be dispersed and those seeds will be dispersed when the berries are ripe. And when the berries are ripe, the tannins have polymerized and the less astringent and the methoxypyrazines have decreased. So that's what we're learning here. So the effect of ripening on methoxypyrazines. So we've mentioned that they accumulate during uh, the, the, the stage in the middle of summer before the raison, okay? So the growth of the grapes. Um, but ripening is post the raison. And of course, methoxypyrazines decrease at this time. Other aroma compounds uh, and other precursors, such as terpenes, for example, are increasing during ripening. But methoxypyrazines decrease. OK, great. Uh, and what, um, what either contributes to more methoxypyrazine or what reduces methoxypyrazine characteristics in the vineyard. Um, so there are various factors that can contribute to the reduction or rather the non-reduction, depending, of course, on the season 
of methox methoxypyrazine. So you will note here you've got a slide, you've got MP on the left hand side, meaning methoxypyrazine concentration, and then the time. You'll see along this time you have the raison just here, which of course is grape colour change. You will see that methoxypyrazines leading up to the raison increase. And as it gets close to the colour change, it starts to decrease. And the lines here are to, to symbolise one of the key factors. One of the key factors really is the sunlight availability. So you'll see here the top line uh, will, this, I mean, this is nothing for specific, this is no grape specific, it's a hypothetical look of, um, of how sunlight affects the grapes. So you'll see the top line here, um, maintains higher levels and concentrations of methoxypyrazine due to no sunlight, or we're saying no, it's limited, I suppose. And then in the middle, you'll have no sunlight pre raison and sunlight post. So that's little um, before and then some uh, afterwards. And then normal sunlight, where they decrease. So basically, if you don't have sunlight or you have limiting factors of it, it's going to uh, decrease uh, so it's going to keep the methoxypyrazines within the grapes. It's going to maintain them. What other factors do we have as well? Cool temperatures linked into the amount of sunlight available. Also during ripening can have an effect. The vine vigor and the balance are really the growth of the vine, but the overall balance can also have an impact on how much methoxypyrazines. If the vine is in balance, it is said to produce less methoxypyrazines overall, um, or they become more, um, more reduced during their ripening stage. Irrigation is said to also impact it, as well as the availability of nitrogen. Um, and those two, so irrigation and nitrogen fertilization effects, may be attributed to the increase in vigor rather than affecting methoxypyrazines directly. Uh, but both have been found to increase um, IBMP, but it was unclear whether this was due to that more kind of canopy cover that will be produced due to the availability of more nitrogen and water through irrigation. So there's still a lot of study that needs to be done around that fact. So talking a bit about there, about how um, methoxypyrazines are either increased or decreased uh, uh, around that ripening stage. And what is the effect on the final wine style. Well, methoxypyrazines contribute herbaceous characters. Now, on your WSET systematic tasting cards, you'll notice there is a section that says herbaceous, and it will list things like, um, things like green pepper, uh, things like grass, asparagus, tomato leaf, and they are all um, considered as this kind of characteristics that will come mainly from methoxypyrazines. Um, methoxypyrazines, as we mentioned, will increase in grapes as the berry, uh, increase in the grapes as berries grow, and uh, they start to decrease as ripeness uh, is achieved after the raison, as we mentioned before. Typical grape varieties then, which will have some of these, and you'll notice that really these are hugely apart of the same family tree. Uh, so we do need to understand immediately that unripe grapes across the board will have some amount of methoxypyrazine to it. So if you pick grapes very early, you are likely to have some level, maybe minor, but of methoxypyrazine. But there are varieties that tend to really exhibit more than others. And you'll see here, of course, top of the list is Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and Sauvignon Blanc uh, one of the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon, along with Cabernet Franc, and they populate the top three here, all of them typically showing herbaceous characteristics. Carmenere typically has a very intensive um, uh, green note to it, either minty or green pepper. Merlot can do as well, as well as Malbec, and there are others in the world. I'm just giving you a few example varieties that have herbaceous characteristics. I think Cabernet Franc is quite a common one for a lot of you who like Loire Valley Reds. You'll find often herbaceous notes in those wines. Maybe attributed to the grape variety, but maybe also attributed to the fact of all of those things, limiting sunlight, 
um, cooler temperatures, uh, which all can have a big effect. And uh, you'll notice that because Cabernet Franc in Bordeaux is nowhere near as herbaceous as, uh, as the Loire Valley can be, but it still has an element of it. And one last thing really I want to leave you with before we wrap up this little explaining terminology and methoxypyrazine is just the final little contributing factor. And it's a tiny little contributing factor, but can be quite significant. So a few of the methoxypyrazines that could probably end up ruining a wine because of their intensity, um, such as the um, IPMP, so isopropyl methoxypyrazine, are also found in the, uh, in the hemolymph of ladybug species, so that little secretion you'll find with ladybugs. Um, ladybugs often gather on um, very ripe grape clusters around harvest time, so our ladybirds, ladybugs, wherever you may be, and if they are not removed before crushing, and if they maybe make it into the wine must, um, a bit of ladybug taint may be an issue. So if the ladybirds or ladybug populations are specifically explosive, very high around harvest, uh, and maybe you machine harvest, so a lot of the fruit that comes in and there's not as much sorting as you would wish, then ladybirds could end up being as a part of your, your must and this can increase the green notes. And in fact, there are vintages in Burgundy which are often kind of um, unofficially, but they are called ladybird vintages, like 2011 and 2004, due to the effect, the effect that they can have on them. And that's really because they have that secretion that has uh, apparently quite high methoxypyrazine levels in it, uh, and this can of course, find its way into the wine. So you may find some 11s and 4s, certainly a Pinot Noirs, be a little bit more herbaceous than others, um, potentially. I thought that might be a nice little thing to finish on, and maybe not everybody knows about that. So it's quite a, it's quite a fun thing to learn about. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed this short video on methoxypyrazine, on explaining wine terminology. Um, we have a lot of these that are found in the Wine with Jimmy e-learning portal. So this is on www.winewithjimmy.com, which is my dedicated resource for e-learning to help you with the WSET courses from levels one to level four. Uh, we have a huge wealth of information there. So lots of exclusive video content. We put about 25% uh, of our videos go free on YouTube, but the other 75% are tend to be found only on that e-learning portal. Plus there are multiple choice questions, short written answer questions, and things like revision sessions, flashcards, and so on. It's a really useful place for you to supplement your studies, to give you the confidence to get you through the WSET courses. As always, please do leave comments and questions or concerns. You can do so on this video on YouTube or get in touch direct. You know how to do that. Otherwise, if you do come to the United Kingdom, come and see me and my team. We have wine schools and a wine bar. So come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.